We've been doing a series for the last couple of weeks talking about healing. They were calling the children's bread, and we started off in Matthew chapter 15 with the story of a woman who came to Jesus because her daughter needed healed. But she was a Gentile. She wasn't in covenant relationship. Jesus hadn't established the new covenant yet. So when she asked Jesus for healing for her daughter, Jesus said, it's not right or it's not good, it's not proper to take the children's bread and to throw it to the dogs. So when Jesus calls healing, that's what he's talking about. When he calls healing the children's bread, there is a wealth of revelation, so much we can understand for Jesus referring to healing in that way because he could have used any analogy, any word picture that he wanted to. He could have said it's not right to take the children's special family heirloom. It's not right to take their prized possession. It's not right to take their treasure. He doesn't say any of those things. He equates healing with the children's bread. And so we talked about healing not being something that's rare and hard to come by, something that just a few people get to experience. It's base level provision for the children of God. And it's important that we understand it that way from his perspective. Because too often, we consider healing something that, you know, you hear of every once in a while. You hear a story. Maybe you get to read a testimony, something neat that happened to somebody's body overseas. And when we set our faith that that's the way healing is, it's rare. It only happens every once in a while, and it only happens to a few special people. That's exactly what it becomes. It becomes something rare that we just hear about from someone else's situation instead of what God wants it to be, desires it to be, and has provided it to be. It's your bread. It's base level provision for the children of God. In fact, he said it's not good, it's not right, it's not proper to take the children's bread. So we can understand from that that anything that tries to take your healing from you, whether it be poor doctrine, bad teaching, a bad attitude, somebody's, anything that tries to take your healing, according to Jesus, he, he doesn't say, you know what, it's good every once in a while for someone to suffer with a condition because they can learn a few things, they can become more Christ-like. He doesn't say it reveals character or builds character. He says, categorically, it is not good, not right, not proper to take the children's bread because it's been provided and it belongs to you. Healing is the children's bread. It is base level provision for anyone who is a child of God. Then last week we talked about the word of God as bread and how you need to take it like you take medicine. That just like you follow the instructions on a prescription or you used to follow instructions on a prescription, we've got to follow the instructions for the word of God. Proverbs chapter 4 tells us exactly what those are. It tells us that God's word is life to those who find them and healing for all of their flesh. There is healing and strength and life located in the word of God. The problem is so few people are willing to pay the price to acquire it that it goes unclaimed and it tells us what the price is it says my son pay attention to my words you've got to pay attention to the word of God it says don't let it depart from your eyes keep it in the midst of your heart you've got to hold on to it love the word of God feed on it spend time in it pay attention give your attention to the word of God we talked about that means you've got to eliminate other things from your life to properly pay attention you've got to eliminate other voices other reports to properly pay attention to the word of God so I hope this week you've been following that prescription paying attention to the word of God If not, let's fix it this week. Pay attention to the Word of God. Read it in the morning. Read it in the evening. Amen. Amen. Because the Word of God is not just bread. The Bible says the Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. So as you begin to read the Word of God, it's like a scalpel going to work. Every whisper that comes to your mind that tells you, you know what, your case is unique. Other people can acquire healing, and it's pretty much true for them. But because of something that happened in your past or or some explanation that you come up with, that you know what, you're just going to have to suffer with that condition. That's just going to be the way that it's just going to progressively get worse. And somehow you're exempted or excluded from this bread. That that is a lie from the enemy. And the Word of God has the ability to draw a divide line and cut that garbage out of your life and leave what is true. You need the word of God to slice those things, to divide properly lies from truth. Amen. Jesus said you will know the truth. It'll do something in your life. What will truth accomplish in your life? 
It will set you free. So think about that for a minute, even just regarding healing. You'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So the, the truth is liberating. The, the truth takes a yoke off of your shoulders and sets you free. So when you get a report about, you know what, the condition, it's getting worse, it's probably just going to continue. That, 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 there's no liberation in that. You, then what do you know? You know that it's not the truth because you will know the truth and the truth sets you free. So, so don't buy into, you know what, my conditions, I'm just going to make, make do as best as I can, but I know it's going to eventually you know, limit my mobility. Listen, those, those are lies and you've got to identify them as lies. If it's not liberating, if it doesn't set you free, then it is not truth. Too many people have been subjected to lies and they consider it truth. They live according to lies. You'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. So you've got to learn how to differentiate. Allow the word of God to divide between joint and marrow, between the thoughts and intentions of your heart to show you what is true and what you you don't have to adhere to. You'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Learn how to apply that to whatever emotions or thoughts, whispers come into your mind. You know the truth, it is, if it's true or not, by whether it sets you free or puts you under a yoke of bondage. Amen? Another thing that keeps people from receiving healing is, is that they learn to enjoy the sympathy that comes along with their condition. You know, we used to tease my brother because when he was younger, it seemed like he loved being injured or having some form of sickness because he would get attention. I remember playing in the neighbor's yard one time and he went down a slip and slide and hurt his neck. And he laid there in that yard until parents came out to check on him. He had a crowd of people, neighbors were coming out. And when there was finally a crowd gathered, he managed to pull himself up to his feet, and he hurt his neck, but he started like limping home, like just to, to make it a little more dramatic. I can still remember him walking back to the house. I thought you hurt your neck, but he loved the attention. Last week, our, our youngest daughter, Hazel, she's two years old, she got into a box of Band-Aids and started slapping Band-Aids all over, all over her arms. So I, I took her out somewhere, and someone was asking, oh, what happened? Did you get cut? No, she's fine. She just likes wearing Band-Aids because it, get, it gets her attention. But people are the same way when they have a condition, some illness, some diagnosis. It makes them special in some way or, or they get attention. Don't make that mistake of falling in love with the attention or the sympathy you get from other people. Don't fall in love with your ability to complain about how bad you have it because in doing so, what you do is you trade your birthright, the children's bread of a healthy, strong body all the days of your life. You're trading that for a bowl of soup of other people's sympathy and sad comments. Oh, poor him, poor her. Don't make that mistake. Don't let your, how special you are be limited to how sick you are. Be special because you carry the likeness of Jesus Christ. That's what sets you apart. That's what makes you unique. Don't, don't be special because you can only eat certain things and your allergies flare up and wh whatever it is. Don't, don't let that define or be how you feel special about yourself. Because you're trading what God has for you and what he's provided for you through the sacrifice of Jesus. Healing is the children's bread. He wants you to have it. He's provided it. Amen. Other people's sympathy isn't that good anyway. I, I, I mean, it's funny on one hand, but I'm being serious. I feel to say this because it, I think maybe in our culture, people will, will buy into sickness and allow it, complain about it, but somehow they, they love it because of the, it makes them unique and special. They, they've got to you know, have special food prepared or special provisions made. And I'm not saying we shouldn't give those people sympathy, but if that's, if that's your case, don't, don't fall in love with that because it will make it difficult, if not impossible, to receive your healing because you're too busy clinging to those things. And again, it's just like, it's like Esau trading his birthright for something far less valuable. Don't, don't make that mistake. I'm not saying that to be cruel. I love you, and I don't want to see you miss out on the healing that's been provided. God wants you to walk all the days of your life with a healthy, strong body, and that's exactly what God's Word tells us. Amen. Amen. Another thing that keeps people from receiving their healing is that they're not certain if it's God's will for them to be healed or not. 
that they're, they're a little iffy on that. Most people would say, I know God can heal me. I know he's all powerful. God can do anything. But they'll pray for healing if, God, if it's your, your will. And that's where the hang-up is. And when you pray, God, if it's your will that I be made well or this person I'm praying for, it really undermines the faith necessary to acquire healing for yourself or for that person. So one of the ways that we can answer that question in our hearts, or in our minds, is to look at what Jesus has provided or what God has provided in Jesus, what has been purchased on our behalf, because that really answers the question of what his will is or not. My kids might not be very certain of whether or not I want them to have ice cream. Maybe, maybe I do, maybe I don't. Does dad want to take us to Tony's or doesn't he? I, I don't know. They can wonder about that. But if I load them up in the car, take them through beautiful downtown Adamston, <laughs> arrive at Tony's, march them up to the window, let them place their order, and then put the money down to buy it, and then the girl pops out a few minutes later with the ice cream cone. At that point, it should have answered every question about what my will is concerning what I want them to have. At that point, it is a shame and a waste for them to still be saying, boy, I don't know if dad wants us to have ice cream or not. I've paid for it. I just bought it. I got it for you. Now it's just whether or not you're going to claim it and enjoy it or stand there wondering while it goes bad. It's the same thing with healing. What answers that question is to look in the word of God, what has been provided? And if we can see that healing is part of the provision, it's been paid for and purchased, that should answer all questions and make it easy for us to grab onto and realize in our faith. Amen? Yeah. So if you have your Bible, turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. It says this, 1 Peter 2, 24, who himself, talking about Jesus, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness by whose stripes <clears throat> you were healed, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree. It's talking about Jesus. Let's us know that he carried, he bore our sins, my sins, your sins. He carried them in his body that came on him on that tree. It's talking about when he went to the cross. <clears throat> now, why did Jesus bother carrying our sins? Well, it tells us exactly why. Why did he carry our sins? that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness. The reason Jesus carried our sins, there was a purpose in it, so that we could be righteous. Jesus carried our sins for one reason, so that we could be clean, that we could be free, that we could have sin removed from our life, and we could become righteous. In fact, the, the last verse of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says that Jesus became sin why? So that we could become the righteousness of God in him. So you know that when you sin, you can go to God and ask for forgiveness. But the reason God is able to forgive is not just because he is a nice, loving, forgiving God. That's not why he forgives. There was a very real price paid to acquire forgiveness. In fact, Hebrews 9.22 says, Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. So if you came and you worked up your best apology speech, God, I am so sorry, I'll never do it again, I promise. You had just the right amount of tears, you had it all brought together. If Jesus' blood had never been shed, you could come to God and he could say, boy, I feel bad about it. I'm glad you realize what you did is wrong, but I'm sorry, there, there, there is no forgiveness. God's forgiveness for you is not based on his kind personality or the mood that you catch him in. It is based on provision that has already been made because blood was shed on your behalf and when we know that that there's forgiveness in Jesus that's how we get faith and we're able to acquire that forgiveness in fact flip a couple pages over to 1st John chapter 1 just a couple pages to your right 1st John chapter 1 verse 9 it says if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness if we say that we have not sinned we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Because all of us have sinned, right? The Bible says that all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But this tells us that we can come to God, we can ask for forgiveness, we can confess our sins to him, and it tells us he is faithful. He is faithful. You can know when you come to him and confess your sins. He is faithful and just to forgive your sins and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. This is such a great verse. 
Because I've had times, maybe you've had them too, where you made mistakes, you know that you blew it, you feel terrible, you feel dirty, you feel the conviction. And you go to God and you confess your sins. Lord, Lord, forgive me. I know I messed up. I know I shouldn't have done it. You confess them. But you still feel guilty and ashamed. You still feel like a dirt ball that God wants nothing to do with. You feel like you can't really worship God. You feel like somehow you're excluded from his presence. That's how you feel. But it's times like that when verses like 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 are so important. Because you can say, I, I know I feel this way, but the Bible tells me if I confess, if I confess, he's faithful. He'll forgive me. He'll cleanse me. And you can hold on to that and know despite how you feel, provision has been made. And he's faithful to cleanse us right but it goes on from there and says this chapter 2 verse 1 my little children these things I write to you so that you may not sin and if anyone sins we have an advocate with the father Jesus Christ the righteous and he himself is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only but also for the whole world He himself is the propitiation that word means he was the sacrifice he took our place he paid the price So we know that God is faithful to forgive our sins, but why? That's linked with the fact that Jesus the righteous is the propitiation. He's an advocate with the Father. That's the same word, parakletos, in the Greek that's translated talking about the Holy Spirit in John chapter 16. We have an advocate, one to come alongside us, one to help us. Jesus himself, who doesn't just say, God, you really need to forgive, and they are super duper sorry. No, that's not what forgiveness comes from. He was the sacrifice, and because provision has been made, that price has been paid, then we know we can go to him and know he is faithful. You can know that you know that you know. You don't have to go to God and say, God, I, you know, I'm really sorry. If it's your will, could I please be forgiven? God, I'd like to be righteous and clean, but I'm not sure where you stand on it. I don't know if you want me righteous or clean. You never have to pray that way, right? You know he wants you clean. He wants you to be forgiven because the price has been paid. Now, I know this is common, but I'm trying to find solid ground for us to make the next step. Because back to to 1 Peter 2.24, after saying he bore our sins on that cross or on that tree so that we could be righteous, then he throws in, and by his stripes you were healed. And in doing so, he is linking together the forgiveness of sins so we can be righteous with the cleansing of our bodies so we can be healthy. Because that provision comes from the same source. Jesus' atoning work, it's the same work that provided both forgiveness of sins and salvation and healing for our bodies. So if it's the same work, then it's the same availability for anyone who would believe. Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Salvation, it's the atoning work of Jesus. So in Jesus' work, salvation wasn't in great supply, but healing was just in limited supply. It it was the same work that provided both of them. In fact, he's quoting from Isaiah 53 in 1 Peter 2.24 when he says that. Let's jump back. We've read it before in this series, but let me read to you Isaiah 53, verse 4 and 5 again. So just like you know that it's God's will based on provision that you can be forgiven. The price has been paid. You can have that same kind of confidence when it comes to healing. It's not catching God in the right mood. It's not being one of the lucky ones. It's not jumping through all the right hoops. It's based on the provision of what God accomplished in Jesus. That healing has been provided. Isaiah 53, verse 4. Surely he has borne our sicknesses. If your Bible says griefs, Hopefully it's got a little number with a footnote. You can jump down and see the real meaning of the word. Literally in Hebrew, it's not griefs, it's sicknesses. Surely he has borne our sicknesses. Well, that's the same kind of language that Peter just used regarding our sin. He he has borne our sins. Why? So that we can be righteous. Then why in the world did he also carry our sickness? If he carried our sins so we could be completely free from sin, so sin could be removed from our lives as far as the east is from the west, then why did he also carry our sicknesses? It's for the same reason. Surely he has borne our sicknesses and carried our pains. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. That's what Peter was quoting. By his stripes by the beating he took on his flesh healing was made available for you and I just like it says Jesus became sin why did Jesus become sin so we could become righteous you know a few verses later it tells us that Jesus also became sick 
he became sickness? Let me read Isaiah 53 in Young's, Young's literal translation, verse 10. And Jehovah hath delighted to bruise him. He hath made him sick. Jehovah hath delighted to bruise him. He hath made him sick. Now, why, why did God the Father delight in making Jesus sick? Just because he's twisted and warped that way? No, that's not it at all. Just like he delighted to make him sin because he knew he was making us free from sin. That's why he was delighted to make him sick because he knew he was providing healing for each one of us. Healing is the children's bread. You can know that it's his will because he's already purchased it for you. But just because something has been purchased for you doesn't mean that you get to enjoy it. Just because something has been bought doesn't mean necessarily that you get to enjoy what has been purchased on your behalf. I was at the grocery store just last week, and the guy in front of me made his purchase, walked out the door. I stepped up to the cashier. It was my turn, but she realized that that man had made his purchase and left his groceries there. She had to flag somebody down to grab him and run him out to him in the parking lot because he's made his purchase, but until he grabbed hold of it and made his claim, he was going to walk home without the very thing that had already been purchased for him. It's the same thing with us in healing. It's been provided, but you've still got to grab hold of it and claim it for yourself. The Bible says that the devil is a liar. He's also a thief. What does a thief do? A thief just doesn't grab stuff that belongs to him. A thief, by definition, takes things that belong to somebody else. Healing is yours, but that doesn't mean the devil's not going to come and try to rob you of it because that's what he does. That's how he operates. So don't go by people's experience or your own experience. Well, you say healing's been provided, but boy, I've suffered a lot of sickness. Listen, you're being robbed from and you're being lied to. You've got to grab hold of it and demand that that provision become a reality in your life. Just because something is yours doesn't mean that you get to enjoy it until you stake your claim. There's a great example of this in Acts 22. In Acts chapter 22, the Apostle Paul is in Jerusalem preaching the gospel. He's got some people listening to him talking about Jesus being the Messiah. But then he gets to a part where he starts talking about this good news being available for the Gentiles and when he says that, that's all they can handle. And they start saying, we've got to kill this guy. They just lose their minds at that. So that's where we're picking up the story. Verse 22. It says, and they listened to him until this word. And then they raised their voices and said, away with such a fellow from the earth. He is not fit to live. Then as they cried out and tore off their clothes and threw dust in the air, the commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks and said that he should be examined under scourging so that he might know why they shouted so against him. Exam this examination by scourging, it's not like they're going to give him a true and false quiz. They're going to beat him. That word scourging means to be flogged or to be whipped. They're about to start beating him until they can try to get the truth out of him. So Paul's about to be beat. Verse 25, And as they bound him with thongs, Paul said to the centurion who stood by, Is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? When the centurion heard that, he went and told the commander, saying, Take care what you do, for this man is a Roman. Then the commander came and said to him, Tell me, are you a Roman? He said, Yes. The commander answered, with a large sum, of, sum I obtained this citizenship. And Paul said, but I was born a citizen. Verse 29, then immediately those who were about to examine him, beat him, flog him, whip him, those who were about to examine him withdrew from him. And the commander was also afraid after he found out that he was a Roman and because he had bound him. So Paul is about to be beaten. And not, not a few swats on the rear end. They're about to lay his back open. That's what Romans did. They delighted in beating people down. That's what is about to happen. He is tied, bound. They're about to lay into him. But he's got certain rights because of his citizenship. He's got certain rights to go along with how and where he was born. But unless he speaks up and claims those rights, he's going to receive that beatdown. 
That's what's going to happen. Whether he has those rights or not, he's got to claim them. It's only when he speaks up and says, hey, hey, hold on a second. That's not lawful for someone who's born the way that I was born. Otherwise, he would have gotten the beating. That's what happens to so many believers. It's been provided. It belongs to them. You're a citizen of heaven. You're a child of God. Healing is your bread. But until you speak up, Paul would have been beaten unless he spoke up. You're going to suffer sickness and disease and everything everyone else has to suffer until you open your mouth and say, these are my rights as a child of God. I insist on them being realized in my life. Everything that is contrary to that is a lie from the enemy and I refuse to be stolen from. Thank you so much for watching Brand New You. Before we let you go, we want to give you an opportunity to ask Jesus into your heart. If you would like to make that decision today, simply repeat this prayer after me with your heart and your lips out loud. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Wash me and cleanse me. Make me new. Jesus, I believe that you died for me and you are coming back again for me. I love you and I give my life to you forever. In Jesus' name, amen. If you said that prayer for the first time today, we want to congratulate you. And we want to encourage you to visit brandnewyou.cc and click the I Just Got Saved tab. This way, we can follow up with you and send you a free gift in the mail. For more information on Center Branch Church or the Brand New You broadcast, please visit brandnewyou.cc. Here, you can respond in multiple ways. Let us know if you made a commitment to follow Christ while watching, or if you have any comments, questions, or concerns. You can also email your responses and prayer requests to info at brandnewyou.cc. Another great way to keep in touch with our ministries is to download the Center Branch app. Here you can read your Bible, take notes, listen to podcasts, and much more. The Center Branch app is available on all platforms. Download it today for free. If you would like to partner with us financially at Brand New You, simply visit brandnewyou.cc and click the Giving tab. There, you can follow the step-by-step -step instructions to make your donation. Or you can text to give by texting brand new and the amount to 59769. You just finished watching a portion of our series called The Children's Bread. One of the main points we talk about in this series is how important faith is in receiving and keeping your healing. Now we know that the Word of God says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So we have made a CD series available for you to get this in your spirit. You can receive this series two ways. The first is by going to brandnewyou.cc and visiting our product page. This way you can purchase that CD there. The second is by going to the giving tab and making a donation of any amount. And we'll send this to you for free. Thanks for watching and may God richly bless you.